In today's Africa, as in ancient times, the drum is used for communication. It is used for passing information and also for entertainment at social gatherings. The African drums was called to duty as over 450 delegates from 24 African countries and from 50 other nations gathered in Mountain House, the International Conference Center of Initiatives of Change. The conference, titled An Honest Dialogue for a Clean and Just Africa, was organized by Agenda for Reconciliation, a trust-building program in conflict transformation. The conference aimed to facilitate an honest and productive dialogue for a well-governed and corrupt free Africa. The enduring image of post-colonial Africa depicts some heart-breaking realities. Many questions that Africans and other observers of the Africa scene want answers to include can Africa feed itself and offer health security to its citizens? Does Africa have the human and financial capacity to develop the structure needed for sustainable development? Is there a solution to corruption and bad governance? It is this quest for the way forward that the conference was organized. Participants included policymakers, diplomats, traditional rulers, academics, women leaders, grassroots activists, youths from Africa and the diaspora, as well as their counterparts from other parts of the world. The president of Initiatives of Change International, Dr. Cornelio Sumaruga, welcomed participants to Mountain House. Chris Scott, as president of Initiatives of Change International, I have uh, the honor, ladies and gentlemen and dear friends, to open the Agenda for Reconciliation Conference on an honest uh, dialogue for a clean and just Africa. Gathered here in this unique conference center of Mountain House, where people of all continents, cultures, nationalities, beliefs, and religions work together toward change, locally and globally, by starting with change in their own lives, wishing to work with the assistance of the Almighty for healing the wounds of history where cultures and civilizations meet, we cannot live in isolation. We are part of the world and we have to look at the world and to appreciate constantly the actuality of the international situation. Initiatives of Change affirms that peace and security will never be found by piling one injustice on another. Initiatives of Change International continues to be available to provide in and from CO its active contribution to trust building. Also speaking at the opening is His Highness Alaji Ado Bayero, the Emir of Kano, a Muslim leader from Nigeria. In the contemporary world in which we are living today, as ever before, the need for meetings like this is of great importance to us in finding solutions to the crisis facing our various nations and the world. Africa today is at a critical point where many more nations are embracing the democratic process. The big challenge is how do we sustain this process and maintain the basic principles of freedom 
and democracy. Africa needs fresh minds to develop our economy and infrastructures. Taking up the challenge and setting the agenda, Dr. Ruel Koza shared his vision for a clean and just Africa. A clean Africa we need very badly. Clean in all sorts of dimensions. Clean political leadership, clean socio-economic programs devoid of corruption, even a clean environment. In my humble opinion, an ideal Africa is one that redefines the term emergent. We are described as an emergent political economy. An ideal Africa is one that redefines the term emergent from a notion of condensation and derision to a term of vibrancy, technological prowess, respect and envy. The ideal Africa or the Africa we want to see is one that has successfully translated the concepts we have of humanity and communal relations into cooperative models of government, institutional and individual relations right across the continent, not just in patches. The intellectuals of this Africa that we would like to see in place should be nurtured by native founding principles and a spirit of insatiable inquiry. The Africa we want to see stands for decency and humanness. It convinces its sons and daughters in the diaspora that they should lend their weight to continental development and hold their hearts and heads high as representing the great name of Africa. That is a picture many Africans hope for, but there is a gap between the ideal Africa and the realities on the ground. The deputy to the PayPal nuncio to the United Nations in Geneva, Monsignor Fortunatus Umachuku, outlined some of these realities. Wars, massacres, rapes, famines, sicknesses, indolence, corruption, poor governance, and so on. The despair and a sense of hopelessness in living in poverty and the challenge of dealing with the scourge of corruption was captured by Lucy Keckler of the Swiss chapter of Transparency International. Corruption is an abuse of power, usually the abuse of power vested in civil servants, in officials, by the people of that country. So there is an abuse of trust there as well and, of course, an abuse of resources. And I tell people that I work on issues of corruption and especially when I say that I also work in Africa, which is conventionally known by its destitution, by its poverty, by conflict. What I get is this overwhelming sense of powerlessness. People either scoff at me or they are apathetic. They say, but that's just the way it is. You will never get rid of corruption. Corruption is stronger than what individuals can do. Antonio Guterres, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, spoke with characteristic openness and honesty on the challenges Africa faces, giving Liberia as an example. In Liberia, there are, there are about 30 doctors, 30 doctors for the whole country. In Liberia, a teacher has a salary of $20 per month, less than $1 per day. In Liberia, the capital Monrovia has no running water, no electricity, no sewage system, no garbage collection. In Liberia, the members of government have practically no salaries. Dr. Chris Landsberg, director of the South African Center for Policy Studies, called for more attention to be given to conflict resolution and post-conflict reconstruction of war-torn countries. What the DRC in Liberia and Sierra Leone and, uh, and many countries on our continent will suggest to you is that post-conflict reconstruction is absolutely vital for us in Africa. We have to become more serious about trying to prevent countries 
from relapsing into conflict once we've uh, entered uh, peace deals. So the continent, the new architecture, places a huge emphasis on post-conflict reconstruction. Guterres condemned the marginalization of Africa. When the tsunami happened, you have a massive financial support to all operations in the tsunami. But if you look at the Democratic Republic of Congo, you have people dying for artificial reasons in numbers that correspond to a tsunami every six months. But there is no, there is no impact in the global media every six months corresponding to the impact that existed about the tsunami. In this marginalization that Africa has been submitted in the globalization process, I believe that the worst form of marginalization has been in relation to information, in relation to the media, in relation to the basis of communication of today's world. And this, is a this has a dramatic impact because if the media is not there, the public opinions are not motivated. They don't have an influence on parliaments and on governments. And the money goes elsewhere. And the concerns go elsewhere. And solidarity is expressed elsewhere. What is the way forward? Whose responsibility is it to bring about a lasting change, a transformation? Blaming others or finger-pointing has not achieved much. While acknowledging the errors of history and some of the unfortunate intricacies of international politics with regards to Africa. Mwachuku had some hard truths for the Africans, a time for an honest dialogue. Insulting the Westerners, telling them to their face, yes, I've told them off. After telling them off, you come home, we still have our problems. New spirit means new mentality. How do Africans see themselves? If you have no personal esteem, you are not going anywhere. If you do not regard yourself as equal to the tax, task, you are not going anywhere. Look, years of slave trade and of slavery have made Africans think that it is normal for them to be second pipers, such that many Africans prefer less qualified people that are not of the same skin, of the same continent, to their own experts that are from the same continent. So you do not esteem, you don't have the self-esteem. Let us try in our educational system to inculcate self-esteem. It is important to note the efforts of continental institutions like the Africa Union and other regional bodies in dealing with the huge challenges that have hindered development. There is a determined search for African solutions to African problems. I think it's very important to recognize that Africa has today an extremely sophisticated concept of political and economic integration and an institutional framework that is indeed remarkable. The new Partnership for Africa's Development, NEPAD, a grand plan of the African Union, is a comprehensive blueprint and socio-economic program to combat corruption and implement essential actions to ensure Africa's socio-economic development. If you look at the African Union and the way it is built, with its Peace and Security Council, with all its mechanisms defined, of course, in law, in international law. If you look at African refugee law, that is better than the Convention. If you look at what it is today, the African Court uh, for Human and uh, People's Rights. If you look at the concept of economic integration by regions, and then with the NEPAD as a framework for economic integration and development at the level of the African continent. And the fact African countries have accepted a mechanism of peer review that, of course, represents a clear commitment to improve uh, its uh, development and the quality of its institutions. We all acknowledge that the problem is not lack of, of a conceptual framework. The problem is not even lack of strategy. The problem is that the conditions for implementation are just not there. 
and the conditions for implementation are not, just not there by a large extent for lack of support of the international community and for lack of resources to implement what has been decided. You can argue about many of our challenges and problems and weaknesses in the continent, but the one thing you have to admit, the continent has become better over the last seven years to make its own peace and to give substance to this idea of African solutions to African problems. While charity begins at home, Africa does not exist in isolation and therefore need the support of the international community. What help is Africa asking the rest of the world? What is Africa wanting from the outside world? What does it seek? Um, many of you may not be aware, but I find it uh, very I find it very reassuring that over the last seven years, the continent has played a huge emphasis on the idea of a new relationship with the outside world. The continent wishes to break with a paternalistic relationship of donor-recipient between Africa and the outside world. I will be the first to say to you that the challenge of partnership between two unequals is, of course, a huge challenge. But it is possible to come up with a paradigm of partnership. The continent has put on the agenda this idea of a strategic partnership between itself and the outside world. Now we know in any partnership um, there are supposed to be mutual responsibilities and mutual accountability between two sides. The African Union and its continental program, the New Partnership for Africa's Development, takes this idea of mutual responsibility and mutual accountability between itself and the outside world very seriously. And let me just spell out some of the elements of this new partnership. First, the two sides will have commitments. Africa, first of all, commits to take governance, good governance, and democratization very seriously. The continent takes seriously the idea of creating an environment for economic growth. Uh, the continent undertakes to uh, put in place mechanisms to root out corruption, uh, of course a terrible problem uh, in Africa. We have a very innovative idea in the continent, this idea of a, an African peer review mechanism where African governments and civil society monitor progress towards good governance and democracy. So the continent certainly said that it is willing to play its part in uh, mutual accountability. Uh, not in the least the idea of making our own peace, taking the major responsibility for taking peace. But surely the outside world must have responsibilities. And there are clear responsibilities. I don't think the question is whether Africa continues to need aid. Surely the international community has, since the 1970s, made a commitment to uh, give on an annual basis 0.7% of their GDPs towards aid. The question therefore is not whether Africa needs aid, the question is what that aid is supposed to do. And I want to put it plainly that we need aid to build our capacities to take care of our own destiny and our own future, to strengthen our institutions, our continental institutions, our sub-regional institutions in Africa. Saying that let's invest in prevention but let us also try to understand the underlying causes of, of the war. Sometimes we mean very, very well as members of international community go in, but without understanding the situation, sometimes you do cause more problems uh, than do good. Uh, you take a country like Mozambique uh, uh, that has had a peace deal for over uh, a dozen years now, Angola that is slowly but surely uh, emerging out of a civil war for uh, 30 years. The war continues in a very subtle way there because of the scourge of millions of landmines uh, in our region. Surely the international community can help us to deal with this problem. We know that the attention uh, span for Africa is often very limited, but I wish to uh, make the case that 
if the Western powers will not send troops to Africa, which is not uh, a possibility, I believe, in the near future, that they will in fact send uh, troops. If they don't send troops, the least the Western powers can do in the spirit of partnership is to help to make the resources and the equipment available for Africans to keep their own peace. For corruption to thrive, there must be a corruptee and a corruptor. <laughs> and all too often, when we talk about Africa, we're talking about the corruptees. In fact, why we actually participate in corruption is that there are very, very, very keen and willing corruptors. And we would appeal to those that actually have the wherewithal, the facility to corrupt us, to withhold that facility from the corruption. It takes two to tangle in corruption. Africa wants a free trade deal. One of the most contentious issues in Africa's relationship with the outside world is, of course, this terrible problem of farm subsidies. The continent simply cannot compete with the kind of farming subsidies and prowess in Europe. That is a major challenge. And if those of us outside our governments really want to make a contribution to Africa, let's hold all our governments fire to the feet. Those of us in Europe and the West and those of us in Africa. Let's remind our governments about the commitments they have made. Uh, I find it innovative. I find it refreshing that the continent is seeking a new relationship with the outside world. One based on genuine partnership, not a recipient donor relationship. But that partnership must emphasize African priorities. It must be a transparent partnership. It must be free from old strings that we've set. It must be committed on a long-term basis as opposed to the short term. And we must live up to both trade and aid. Then I want to say a word about the United Nations, literally a brief word. Nowhere in the United Nations Charter does it, says, does it say everywhere but Africa. We're going to have to remind the United Nations about its obligations towards the continent of Africa. Over 60% of agenda items are dominated by African affairs. And the UN, and particularly the UN Security Council, will have to become serious about partnership with Africa. Our institutions have shown their commitment to policy, but our institutions are very weak. The African Union works under the most unbelievable circumstances, but the African Union is, over, is is overstretched. Its capacities are very thin. You only have 200 people working in the entire African Union Commission having to service 53 nations. It's not possible to have good governance in a country if you don't finance the software of democracy, which means that the international community will have to understand that the crucial element for an African development to be possible is to create the conditions for a sustainable funding of the work of governments, parliaments, and the essential parts of public administration with decent salaries that allow for people not to be entirely subject to corruption and other forms of pressure. And this also needs to be massively, massively uh, uh, accompanied by a huge investment in education, in training, and in the infra and the infrastructures of the new knowledge-based economy and society to bridge the digital divide and to avoid that the emergence of a knowledge economy and the knowledge society becomes a major factor for impoverishment of the African continent. And the only way to uh, succeed in a knowledge-based economy, in a knowledge-based society, is to have people educated, people trained, and this must be an absolute priority of all forms of cooperation with the African continent in the present situation. And beyond that, of course, access to trade. Beyond that, of course, access to foreign investment and creation of mechanisms of guarantee for that foreign investment to be possible. And of course, the need to have a much bigger effort in aid to the development of the continent. And of course, the need to 
implement effective eradication policies in relation to the big pandemias. There is a package of things that need to go all together. It's not possible just to go bit by bit or country by country. You need to have a global strategy and a global contract between the international community and the African continent. I do believe it's possible to work for that. It will probably not work everywhere, but there are many African countries where this is already possible now and many others that with sufficient support can make it possible in the near future. And at the same time, you need to have a massive investment in peace, in the prevention of conflict, in conflict resolution, in creating the conditions for countries in transition to be effectively supported. If there is something the international community does not know how to handle is the situations in transition after a conflict. The international community knows how to deliver humanitarian assistance. The international community knows more or less how to support the development process, but only when institutions are stable, only when rules are established. The bridge between emergencies and sustained development is a bridge that has never been built. And what we can now see in many African countries that have emerged from conflict is an extreme difficulty in having enough support for this difficult transition period. Many of the institutions, I remember that in Liberia again, the World Bank and the IMF are still getting, even if token, of course, but they are still getting every year money from Liberia to pay for the arrears of the past debts. It is obvious that this is something that should have been forgotten. It is obvious that it does make sense to look blindly at a certain number of rules that obviously are meaningful in a context of stability and in the context of relative prosperity, but have no meaning at all when looking at a country that has been devastated by war, subject to the worst forms of dictatorship, and is trying to emerge for a new life and is trying to build a new society. This massive investment needs to be done in a coordinated way, respecting the identity and the strategies that the Africans have demonstrated within the context of the African Union that they are able to implement if the adequate conditions are there for that to be possible. It's a massive investment, but it is a duty for mankind. I don't think it is possible to go on looking at the African continent with the kind of indifference we are witnessing today. I think the African Union itself must become serious about partnership with its own people. We don't show enough respect for partnership with African civil society institutions, African NGOs, and oftentimes when we talk partnership, it is too much partnership with the outside world and not enough partnership with our own people. Civil society actors, we should also familiarize ourselves with the elements of this new architecture because together we can build a prosperous and peaceful Africa. After all is said and done, we can pass policies and adopt policies um, that is very progressive, but unless we become serious ourselves as Africans about implementation, about making sure we live by these norms, these values, these principles, then our new peace architecture will mean very little. We need peace. It is time for us to start constructing Africa. It is time for us to begin a new heart, core, agile, courage. It is time for us to begin a new Africa, a new spirit, a warm spirit, the spirit that makes us to rebound. We don't want to remain grounded. We want to rebound and fly and fly and fly. Now in order for this to come about, we need leadership. The attendant type of leadership to bring about the ideal Africa we want to see is server leadership. And I use the term server advisedly, not servant leadership. Because servant leadership has connotations of master and servant. The kind of leadership that we would like to see in place is at your service leadership, server leadership. The ideal African server leader believes 
that the locus of control for Africa's future is within Africa herself. The server leader lives by the tenets of consultation, does not dictate. By, by, by the tenets of consultation, persuasion, and cohabitation. Cohabitation in a geographic sense as well as in cohabiting with other people's ideas and shuns coercion and domination. The defining features of this style of leadership are probity, humility, integrity, compassion, and humanity. In other words, Ubuntu or African humanism. It is dedicated to demonstrating competence and tenacity and a sense of efficacy, an attitude that says, I can. May I conclude by commenting on what I believe contemporary African leaders should actually be dedicating themselves to. As contemporary African leaders dedicated to realizing our ideal Africa, we must lead by example and be known less for what we say and more for what we deliver. Less for what we control and more for what we shape. Less for titles and positions and more for expertise and competence. Less for the goals we set and more for the mindsets we develop and more for our integrity, compassion, and exceptional abilities and imaginative capabilities. I thank you very much. So like what the world needs, you know, so this is the place to come to get it. I'm hoping that this whole conference, that we will have another conference like this next year. Um, I'm hoping that there will be more and new people who would come. Uh, I think there is uh, an enlivened spirit in the house. I believe that there have been uh, discussion on issues that affects the continent and people really have been looking for soul searching answers to the problems that they've been bringing and I believe that the dialogues and the discussions have gone very well. The community that I've been in, the panelists and the speakers have all brought forth some great information that literally can be brought into a, an environment for further discussion but also a realistic view of what's really happening on the continent that it does not have to stay in this building but that we have an opportunity really to take it back to our respective homes and to our community. Can it ever make sense? Roads filled with dazed eyes that will not live to see promise. We breathe. We breathe. We breathe. We breathe. In our time, a place of newness in my reach, if we listen, I will see all the world's treasures. My heart sings the score. My voice lifts freely to commune with the ancestors. Beautiful images of women, all those that came before me. We breathe the same breath. We give, receive, be, manifest the vision of our time. I believe a gift is in my reach. It is the color of earth, warm, precious. We, we breathe the same breath. We breathe. 
we breathe the same breath. We breathe. We breathe the same breath. The same breath. We breathe the same breath. The same breath. The same breath. Same, the same, the same.